Hi, everybody. I think we're going to get started. So good evening, and welcome to GBH. I'm John Bradar. I'm the Vice President for National Programming here. And we're so pleased to host you this evening, along with our partners, The Conversation, the Associated Press, and the Chronicle of Philanthropy. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge one very important person who's joining us for the very first time tonight at GBH, our new president and CEO, Susan Goldberg. <laughs> My new boss, no pressure or anything like that. <laughs> Welcome, Susan. First of many, I'm sure. The health and well-being of everyone across the globe depends on mitigating the deadly effects of climate change. But so many challenges remain, which is why GBH is committed to engaging Americans on this issue. As a leader in public media, we're working to generate awareness and discourse to inspire us all to be caretakers of our planet. For nearly 40 years, we've reported on climate change through the lens of science, investigative journalism, history, children's programming, and local and international news. In 1983, NOVA was the first series to air a national documentary on global warming. I actually went back and checked this out earlier today, and that film featured some guy named Al Gore, <laughs> who apparently had some concerns about the issue. Since then, maybe taking his lead, NOVA has produced 30 more films addressing climate change, more than half of those in the last five years. Today, our local and international news and radio teams publish in this space routinely, whether it's GBH News, Cape and Islands Radio, or The World, our global program with PRX. We're exploring how individuals, communities, and institutions are tackling climate change. And our national programs can look at the issue from multiple angles. Frontlines, the power of big oil, investigates the unprecedented legal effort by states and cities across America to hold the oil industry to account for climate change. This series reveals the 50-year story of how fossil fuel companies learned from their own scientific research in the 1970s and 1980s that CO2 emissions would change the climate with potentially catastrophic consequences. And yet, they set out on a decades-long campaign to hide or distort the science. Fittingly, Frontline will next look at how climate change is driving migration. In April, American Experience, our history series, will premiere The Sun Queen, which tells the story of Maria Telkis a pioneering scientist at MIT who in the 1940s and 1950s developed the first technologies using solar power, laying groundwork for today's booming solar industry. But Telkis wasn't taken seriously by the male establishment and early gains were ignored, costing precious time in our ongoing climate challenge. Also this April, NOVA will launch Climate Across America, a multi-platform project for PBS that will showcase inspiring climate solutions being implemented in local communities across the country, from clever ways of cooling cities, to using Native American knowledge to control wildfires out west, to no-till farming to make our cropland more resilient in the face of extreme weather. This initiative will also help train local media makers and students in effective climate storytelling. We are also working on sea change, a new three-part documentary series from GBH that tells the story of the Gulf of Maine, which is warming faster than 99% of global oceans. The series equates ocean health with human health, and not just along the coasts. As one of our directors put it, the air that folks breathe in Nebraska is made in the Gulf of Maine. To support GBH's efforts around climate reporting and storytelling, we have established the Planet Future Fund, which will help to support and advance the climate-focused work of many of our programs. The need for trusted, fact-based reporting is essential to the future of the Earth. And is that enough? 
I guess that's what we're here to discuss. It's now my pleasure to bring to the stage Beth Daly, Executive Editor and General Manager of The Conversation US. Welcome, Beth. Thank you so much, John. I thought I'd take a quick second to explain about the conversation because who doesn't know about us? <laughs> Quite a number of people. But um, the conversation is a nonprofit, national, um, independent news outlet. Part of our team is based here at GBH in the world and GBH News. And our mission is to, in the loftiest term, democratize knowledge for the public good. And the way we do that is we want to get trusted advice, I mean, <laughs> trusted advice, trusted expert evidence based research out to the public and w have experts comment on timely news events with truth. And we do that with an amazing collaboration with our 22 editors who work with academics. And every day we publish 10 stories. We're published in about 1,000 news outlets a month now, and 20 million people read us a month, which is really a great testament to our eight-year-old model. Um, but I wanted to tell you who we were first, because the next part is really something more magnificent. About three years ago, um, Bruce Wilson, if you want to wave a hand, Bruce Wilson, <laughs> of the conversation, who's been here since the start, um, convened a group of news um, outlets, the Associated Press, represented today by Ron Nixon. Ron, if you want to give a quick hi. <laughs> and um, the conversation, of course, and the Chronicle Philanthropy, um, which we have Stacey Palmer here today, if you want to raise your hand or stand up real quick, um, the editor. Um, and we pursued a vision about something no one had tried to do collaboratively with news outlets, and that is to inform America about something that's such an important part of American culture that we don't really talk a lot about on the edges. It's about giving. It's about donating. It's about philanthropy. It's about volunteerism. It's about running nonprofits and how do nonprofits make an impact? How, do, how does anyone make an impact? Um, American have such a culture of giving. And we came together and had a vision that we would each take a part in this. Luckily, we have a foundation with Lily Endowment who saw value in what we proposed to do. And we've been at this for three years now and hope to be at it for many more. This is actually our first live event. COVID crashed all the others <laughs> that we had planned, although we did some virtually. And um, tonight, we're talking about one of the most important issues on the planet, climate. Now, I used to be a climate reporter at the Boston Globe for many, many years, like too many to count. And back then, climate philanthropy was, wow, it was minuscule. It still is minuscule c compared to all philanthropy. But back then, it was very, very tiny. And what the money came from, it was largely from big foundations. Today, the landscape has dramatically changed. There is still large foundations really pouring a lot of money in, thank goodness, to solve what we all know now is the climate crisis. But what we also have are, are wealthy individual millionaires and sometimes billionaires contributing to this really important cause. Lauren, Lauren Powell, Jeff Bezos, and many others are really trying to help the planet and save the planet. But what is, what is the impact of these wealthy individuals? How are they working with people on the ground? How are they dealing with environmental justice issues? What is their impact? How do they measure success? Those are some of the questions we're going to be delving into tonight, which I'm totally excited for because they're really important questions. I can't think of a better person to moderate this other than Caitlin Sachs from NOVA, producer at NOVA. You may not know Caitlin, but you've certainly seen some of her amazing work um, decoding uh, climate polar extremes, and she plays a significant role in the upcoming series that John had mentioned, Climate Across America, looking at solutions from communities that are often unheard from. So without further ado, oh, I do have one more thing to say before Caitlin walks across the stage. We really want to engage with the audience tonight, and the way we're doing that is hopefully you grabbed an index card when you walked in and penciled. If you have a question that comes to you, write it down, raise your hand, and our ushers will come and, and grab it, and we'll be doing questions and answers of the panelists at the end. If you did not grab index card, still raise your hand, and usher will bring you a, a card and repeat. Um, so without further ado, Caitlin, welcome. Thank you so much, Beth. Thank you for having me. I am absolutely flattered to be here tonight moderating this panel. Um, as Beth mentioned, I work for NOVA. I've been working for NOVA for about, um, about eight years now. Change over the last eight years, just in the last eight years. And what 
can learn about what we can do about it. And now NOVA is a science technology series and certainly science and technology can play a role. But in a lot of ways, it does come down to money. So how much money are we talking about here? How much will it take to fix this? There have been analyses on this. A recent analysis by ClimateWorks says it will take between four and nine trillion dollars per year to solve climate change. This is an estimate. So that has 12 zeros on it. How are we possibly going to get How can big collectors play a role? And how can individuals who maybe don't have the money make their Director of the Campaign for Nature, which is leading the effort to support. <laughs> this organization is leading the effort to support the 30 by 30 campaign to protect 30% of the lands of, of the world's land and ocean by 2030. Nick Tilson is the president and CEO of the NDN Collective, an indigenous-led <laughs> activist and advocacy organization. And Andrew Steer is the president and CEO of the Bezos Earth Fund, which has committed to contributing $10 billion to the cause over 10 years. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Again, I am totally flattered to be moderating a panel with you all. Um, and I'm going to ask you to tell me a little bit more about um, your work, your your organization, and um, your organization's philosophy on climate philanthropy. How how can philanthropy get us to twelve zeros? <laughs> so, Ash, why don't we start with you? Okay, uh, sounds good. So, I'll be speaking from more from my perspective and the perspective of uh, my research team and the research we do than my organization per se, uh, but. You know, I've been working on, uh, as part of a research team for the last five years, we have one more year to go, um, researching how big donors, uh, specifically private foundations, how they can affect conservation and climate. And the way we've done this is we've talked to both donors themselves in uh, working in different contexts and peop local people, local communities, local organizations, indigenous peoples, that are working on the issues as well. So we've gotten pers both perspectives. Um, we've done hundreds of interviews with, uh, I think about 100 folks um, over the last five years. And, um, you know, it's been very interesting. And I think uh, these donors are in a very unique position. Uh, they're highly autonomous. They can be nimble. They can be responsive. Um, they can be innovative. They can do things that other huge donors like government aid cannot do because of their independence, but it really depends on how they work. Um, and so that's something that my work uh, seeks to speak to, um, you know, to, to understand and answer questions like, how can these big donors work in a way that's more just, that's more effective, that's more equitable and enduring, uh, and provide solutions that, you know, we really hope that they can, uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, for example, one of the things we've really, f I think the thing that stood out the most to me is how important it is for these efforts to be aligned with the local context. Uh, and so, you know, it's important for donors to really get to know the people, the geographies and the issues that they're funding. You know, for example, one thing they could do is uh, including indigenous and local communities and organizations in the funding decisions they make, for example. And I could, I could speak more about that, but uh, I'll stop there. We'll get, we'll get to, we'll get to it. Um, Brian, tell us a little bit more about Campaign for Nature. Sure. So Campaign for Nature is a global effort. And as the name implies, we work on the nature part of the equation. 
most often uh, when people are thinking about climate change in the United States, they often think about solar panels or electric vehicles or coal-fired power plants. Um, but globally, we need to make sure that we are protecting and conserving nature if we are going to solve this crisis. It is up to a third of the solution of the climate crisis, and that really comes down to making sure that the lungs of the earth, the Amazon, the Congo Basin, are, are functioning, that the oceans and the kelp beds that, that are so critical for the carbon cycle are, are healthy, that we're protecting mangroves and we're protecting, um, we're protecting peatlands, which are also really critically important for absorbing carbon. And we don't turn these, our best allies in the fight against climate change, our natural systems, into part of the problem. The more we degrade lands, the more that, that becomes part of the uh, carbon emitters rather than carbon sinks. So Campaign for Nature is working on a global effort to try to get a, a target of protecting at least 30% of the world's lands and oceans by 2030. And that would be a global goal that would be adopted in the Convention on Biological Diversity. So many of you have heard of the, the Climate Convention. They had a big COP in, in Egypt just a couple weeks ago. There's a sister convention on biodiversity, the sort of the nature convention that'll be meeting uh, up in Montreal starting on the, on the 7th of December, so just in another week. And they'll be setting targets for what is the world's nature goals for the next, for the next decade. The way we work is we want to make sure that that target is agreed to by countries in the world. We've got a high ambition coalition of more than 112 nations that have endorsed it. We're also trying to make sure that it's done in a rights-based way, that indigenous peoples and local communities' rights and respect is built in. Historically, conservation hasn't done, had a good, done a good job on that. We've seen a, in the past evictions and uh, displacements of indigenous peoples and not respect for their, for their approaches and leadership. And so we're trying to make that change in the policy. And the final effort we do is, is funding. We want to make sure that countries commit, that they don't just set bold policy targets, that they're also putting money forward towards this so that these policies can be implemented. So we're trying to hold the wealthy nations accountable to get some money to developing nations, to frontline communities to develop this. Very quickly on your, on your question about philosophy for, for uh, philanthropy, I am a really big supporter of grassroots organizations and advocacy. I think that um, we've done a lot of studying, we've done a lot of analysis, we've got a lot of white papers. Time now, right now is for people who are making change, grassroots leaders who are holding governments, uh, corporations, and others accountable to drive this change. Thank you, Brian. Nick. Um, uh, Nick Tilson, my Lakota language. Um, and what we do here, you know, at, at Indian Collective is if you look at where the biodiversity in the world is, uh, you know, 85% of the biodiversity that exists in the world, one of the reasons why it exists there is because the role of indigenous people is protecting those places. But then you look at philanthropy historically has underinvested. So like in America, like less than a half of 1% of American philanthropy goes to Native American people. And so Indian Collective is a movement infrastructure organization that both has a grant making arm, uh, a lending arm, an activism arm, and a social enterprise arm that focuses on moving resources and closing that gap and making sure that we're investing into indigenous self-determination. Um, and and we're, we're doing it at a, at a scale that n nobody ever has in the history of philanthropy uh, because, because of the, 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 the moment that we're in. And so Indian Collective does that because if you invest into the indigenous self-determination of indigenous people that are defending, developing, and decolonizing um, its, its contributions to, to, to addressing climate and addressing racial inequality, we're at, we, we work in those cross intersection of those areas. And so uh, Indian Collective you know, does that both through grant making, but also does it through social enterprising. Um, and we, our whole philosophy is defend, develop, and decolonize. Uh, defend, develop, and decolonize. Because we gotta, we gotta keep going after the corporations that are polluting while we're also creating you know, new solutions from the ground up. Thank you, Nick. Andrew. Well, thank you, Caitlin. I'm Andrew Steer, Bezos of Fund. Um, thanks to WGBH, thanks to The Conversation, thanks to Chronicle of Philanthropy, AP. These are great and important conversations, so we're really grateful to be here. Um, look, we're, we're in the battle of our lives, quite frankly. Um, so it's wonderful that affluent people like Jeff Bezos would put $10 billion and he says, 
I don't want you to start a foundation that will last for 100 years. Uh, let's spend it down in this decisive decade. And the question is, how do you do that? Um, because whilst it sounds like a lot, as you've already explained, it's actually not very much. So every single grant we make needs to do two things. It needs to deliver what the grantee is very good at delivering, and it needs to be part of a movement to change an entire system. Mm -hmm. Because it's no longer good enough to have projects that deliver nice things, good results, dollar in, very good dollar out, dollar in, we need many multiples. And that can come from lots of different ways, including policy change, new inventions, um, uh, more private investment, radical changes in the way we think about justice. Those are the kinds of leverages. So the way we um, sort of analyze before we uh, spend, we look at the 50 transitions that need to happen urgently this decade. And whether there's 40 or 70, you know, you can cut and slice it many ways. But if you saw the 50 we look at, they would sound sensible to you. Um, it sounds like a lot of transitions, but they're actually, all of them, pretty big. One of them is getting rid of the internal combustion engine, for example. That's just one. And there are 50 about as big as that. So then the question is, how do you allocate your money? Well, each of those is on a path that will, in time, cross a positive tipping point. The problem is, will that tipping point come soon enough? And so what our job is to ask the question, where is it along that path so that we can nudge it towards that tipping point? Where are the barriers? Where are the intervention points that we can make a difference, so to speak? So that's what we try to do. We try to make change irresistible and unstoppable. And as I think we're all totally aligned on this panel, absolutely central part of this needs to be uh, environmental and social justice. Thanks so much, Nick. So I'm going to ask, ask my, my first question to, um, to um, I'm sorry, thanks so much, Andrew. I'm going to ask my first question to Nick. Nick, imagine you had $10 billion. Where would you be investing it to make, to, to, to make the most impact? Well, I mean, I would, I would be invested into the leadership of, the, of indigenous communities. Uh, because if you, look at, if you look at the front lines of the climate movement or environmental justice movement, indigenous people are like risking their lives and their freedoms, um, protesting these, these, you know, when, when there's no resources there, when philanthropy ha hasn't showed up to those spaces. And those, like, you know, you look, at, you look at the movement in Standing Rock or any of these movements led by indigenous people, there is direct market impact. They, they make it expensive for the polluters to keep polluting because we're going to, we're going to war against them. So that's one, that, that's one area. On, at the same time, you look at, like in, in the U.S., much of the public lands in the U.S. is currently mismanaged. But some of the best managed land in the United States, about 56 million acres of it, is managed by tribal nations. And those are the places that have the best grasses that are contributing to the biodiversity of the planet. And so there's these places and, and making investments into indigenous people, who both who are fighting and developing solutions, uh, is, is a part of the equation. You know, it's an important part of the equation. It also happens to be part of the the, 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 the original you know, place of injustice in this country too. So mixed into this issue of climate is this embedded issue of white supremacy, systematic racism, colonization, and the impact that has had. And climate change is a byproduct of that unsustainable model, unsustainable system. And so by making in, in investments into indigenous you know, communities, you're bringing indigenous knowledge and f philosophy and unlocking that. And so it's not the only uh, part of the equation, but it's a very, very important one. So uh, because that's my job and it's what I'm all about, <laughs> that's where I would make the investments. <laughs> Brian, your focus is on land conservation. And I'm hearing from you, Nick, that um, indigenous communities can play a large role in that. Mm -hmm. From your perspective on you just need, you, you're, you're looking to 
basically conserve as much land as possible. How how are you working with or enabling indigenous communities to do that? What What is that relationship there? Yeah, it's one of the most important things that needs to happen if we're to meet the 30 by 30 goal or, or any large conservation goals internationally. I work mostly internationally. I used to work domestically. But if you look at it internationally, as, as Nick properly said, about 80% of the world's biodiversity is concentrated on lands that are stewarded by indigenous peoples. Uh, many of those indigenous uh, communities don't have official land title. They're not recognized by the states. And so, but when we look at studies, it has shown that their management practices have far surpassed any other management system to maintain biodiversity to keep these natural systems intact. So one of the most important investments we can make to, to meet the 30 by 30 goal is to secure land tenure rights for indigenous peoples and local communities. So there's a few entities, a thing called the Tenure Facility that's set up. We've worked with the Rights Resources Initiative to set up an initiative called Clarify that is working to get grants to, um, to make those system changes. Some of it's like legal changes in countries to be able to get these tenure rights recognized, money to the communities themselves to, to map and advocate for their, for their territories, but I think that is fundamental to make this work. We work closely with an entity called the Global Alliance for Territorial Communities. You know, I think we've seen a really significant global um, organization of indigenous peoples uh, in the last few years, recognizing that they need to band together globally to be at these climate conventions, to be at the biodiversity conventions, to, to make their voices heard. And they're just starting to be heard, not, uh, not enough by countries, but it is essential if we're going to solve the climate crisis or the biodiversity crisis. And I just want to make sure I heard that stat correctly. You said 80% of, of the world's biodiversity is concentrated um, on lands that are, that are stewarded by indigenous people. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, Ash, I'm, I'm, hearing, I'm hearing a theme here around the um, extreme importance of land conservation. As an individual, when I often think of how, how you know how climate change, I think, oh, well, we need more solar panels and wind turbines and maybe some seawalls. Can you help put us in, put into perspective a little bit um, what, fr from your research, what you're finding are the key areas of investment for most impact? Where does conservation fit into that and where do, you know, some of these other solutions? You know, I, I would say that instead of answering your question directly, I'm, I'm going to uh, kind of take a roundabout way of answering that. I think, you know, going back to what I said before, it's a matter of being uh, a donor, being in touch with the issues, being in touch with the communities, being in touch with the geographies where they want to work or where they plan to work. Um, I think, you know, that it's also uh, a matter of how they work. So not just, you know, what are you giving funding to, who are you giving funding to, but also how is that funding decision made? You know, I mentioned earlier, including uh, <coughs> people on the ground in the conversations that inform funding decisions. You know, additionally, how else are you funding? So uh, f is there flexibility? The environment doesn't work in a linear fashion. And so to give a very inflexible grant or an in, inflexible, uh, you know, way of funding, that's, that's not necessarily the way that we're going to be able to affect environmental change. You know, things happen with the environment on a very long-term scale. So you can't make change happen in a one-year grant cycle or even a three-year grant cycle, right? So long-term funding can really make a difference. Uh, keeping administrative burden low so that people are able to focus on the issues that work. Um, that matter instead of, uh, you know, spending a lot of time writing grants and uh, reporting and things like that. Uh, thinking about how you're going to exit from an issue or from a geography. Um, so I think there's a lot of different ways that donors can work uh, regardless of, of what exactly they're, because there's certainly a lot of, uh, as Andrew mentioned, uh, the 50 different uh, pathways that we need to be looking at. There's certainly a lot of different things to be focused on here. And can you just clarify a little bit what you mean by a, fle a flexible versus an inflexible grant? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, you can imagine what things might be like if, if somebody says, okay, uh, we're going to be working on establishing a marine protected area in um, a country that's facing already facing the effects of climate change and then a Category 5 hurricane hits. Mm -hmm. And they need to be focusing, instead of focusing on establishing a marine protected area, first they need to make sure that people are safe and uh, fed and have clean water and those things so th that they're not um, having as, so they're okay, but also so they're not having as much impact on the environment around them. So 
things change very quickly. You know, there's um, in places where there's a lot of stress on the environment from climate change, we see things come in like diseases in that are affecting coral, that are affecting um, you know animals and trees and things like that. And so that might be something that happens very quickly that somebody who's a practitioner of conservation or climate needs to respond to. And a, for a donor to be open to that kind of innovation and that kind of responsiveness is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And so, Andrew, you uh, probably have the largest pot of money being distributed among the, the people on this panel. Um, and maybe, you identified maybe. that. <laughs> <laughs> I, think that's I don't fair. know, you're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, how, does, how does the Bezos Earth Fund um, decide where those, those points, where, where you help make the, the, the change? irresistible, how do you identify where those are? And also just to build on what Ash is saying, how do you make sure that you're maintaining flexibility as the, as, as the situation changes? Well, it, 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 what Ash says is absolutely right, that, uh, that it's terribly important to be flexible. Um, we actually don't know the path ahead. Anybody who knows exactly how you're gonna decarbonize for this, uh, this decade or the next, you know, is not really serious. We are on an adventure. So we need to be able to adjust quickly. And that's, that's why we complement government spending so well, because government spending is not flexible. It's actually, in, especially in the United States, it's actually very, very specific. And even international aid on the part of, say, USAID, very good quality, but it certainly isn't flexible for the most part. So what we can do is we can come in much quicker, and we can be bolder, we can take risks that others can't. So, for example, the Department of Energy has had a truly brilliant program, but there's just one bad result in Solyndra, the whole thing blew up. In other words, they can't take the risks that, that we can, and so we need to make sure that we bring in a very humble way the, the sort of the complementarity that we have, and we can't be, you know, so demanding of so many metrics that we just tie people up in knots. On the contrary, it is a partnership. So for example, last year, in the, COP, the climate COP in, in, in Glasgow, together uh, with Brian and others, um, well, we, we, the Basels Earth Fund, committed $120 million to support um, uh, Congo Basin conservation. All 120 was dispersed by February, three months later. Um, but that didn't mean we knew exactly what was going to happen to the money, quite frankly. We are a partner with them. So what we did is we said, look, this is incredibly difficult. The Congo Basin is a very, very difficult place. We obviously talked to all the governments. We talked to all the local groups and so on. But then we said, look, I tell you what, rather than you competing against each other, because most NGOs compete against each other, would you be interested in all being grantees and becoming part of a team whereby together we can have engagement with the head of state and so on. And so this summer we went to Gabon, actually Jeff Bezos uh, and his partner uh, Lauren came as well. We convened those, uh, those, those NGOs. And so we're massaging as we go. We are precisely having to be um, flexible. And so I, I think that's really important. Now, as, as Nick and I were talking earlier, um, we also need to empower local groups. So as Nick says, there's something going on now in a really wonderful way, and he's playing a very important role. And we were privileged to put $300 million into United States environmental justice groups over the last 24 months. Um, and, and the whole point of that is to try and build a capacity, which is exactly what, what Nick is doing, and we need to sort of change that. How do we choose what to do we're in the business not of focusing on targets or issues or themes. We're in the business of supporting ideas. So I'll give you one, for example. So there are 480,000 school buses in this country, as you may know. Because education is run at the county level, if you are a child in a poor county, you are going to school on an old bus that has not been very well maintained, and you are breathing air, the equivalent of standing on the street in New Delhi. So why do we finance replacing <laughs> school buses that are diesel with electric buses? Well, it's partly, mainly because of health, but actually it also prevents carbon emissions. By the way, you also create a generation of children who actually learn about this. You link it to the curriculum development. They talk to their parents. 
And then, by the way, at the moment, 96% of all the electric buses in the world are made in China. Wouldn't it be great to have an industry here? That's another benefit. And finally, what about those long summers where a school bus does nothing? That's when it really earns its income because 480 giant batteries taking electricity off the grid when it's cheap and not needed, putting it back on the grid, you can save maybe 100 power plants as a result. That's the uh, sort of idea that has that, aha, uh -huh, that would be interesting. We can't finance 480,000. But what we can do is finance those who are lobbying Congress, helping to write the legislation, which is now in the Infrastructure Bill. It's in the Inflation Reduction Act. There's money going in, and then we work with New York and several other states to demonstrate. We work with the manufacturers, we work with the financiers, and we demonstrate that actually the utilities are willing to pay $20,000 <laughs> a year for a bus because of, the, because of its battery storage ca capability in the summer. It's putting the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together, and suddenly, wow, that's an idea worth fighting for. Thank you, and that, but that really makes tangible that sort of um, um, impact multiplying effect. Now, you touched on something, the, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, Act and, and I want to talk a little bit about that because I think a lot of people don't really know what's in that and um, how, how that that, that money will be accessed. And you, you mentioned something else about how philanthropy can help make federal money more accessible. And so I'm, I'm going to put this to any one of you to answer. Can you explain a little bit about, ab about the Inflation Reduction Act and the, and the Justice 40 initiative? It's obviously trying to get, so, so the Inflation Reduction Act is, 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 um, it is going to get more money into the hands of disadvantaged communities, but philanthropy needs to help with that. Why does philanthropy need to help with that, and how? What does that look like? I can take a quick stab yeah. at it. Um, <clears throat> there was a provision in the, in the Inflation Reduction Act, which uh, people have been fighting for it for a long time, but it's around solar, and it's about the, the, it's, a, it's, it's the tax credit that exists. Um, how solar historically has been financed is through tax, you know, uh, investors that have tax equity uh, appetite that need an appetite for investing into tax equity to get a 30% write-off that attracts the capital to be able to invest into solar. Um, so, but historically, non-taxable entities, like they, were, they, 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 they couldn't utilize it because they were non-taxable entities. Tribal governments, there's 573 federally recognized tribes, uh, it, and, and those are non-taxable entities. But there's still investors into trying to, you know, combat climate change by investing the solar into native, into, into native communities. Under the Inflation Redu Reduction Act, uh, Inflation Act, they're they're now eligible, um, and so are nonprofits. And what this means is that nonprofits and tribes are going to be in a position to be investors into solar projects. The difference is this, instead of receiving a, a tax, uh, a tax uh, benefit, they're actually going to be able to do a cash, a, ca a cash grant. But in order for it to work, the tribes and the nonprofits got to have money up front. Just like a lot, many federal grants are, many federal grants are reimbursement basis. So what's going to happen is this product or this particular provision in, in, the, in, in, in the act will actually work where other investments haven't, as long as tribes and nonprofits in those communities can get the cash up front in order to make the project happen and then get that 30% reimbursement. So that's like one, that's one like really, really tangible. And that was, a, 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 I'm passionate about that when I was in DC just a couple weeks ago talking with the uh, uh, Commerce Department and Treasurer about specifically about that specific provision in the, in the act. And maybe just to, to sort of add to that, the U.S. federal spend has a very interesting characteristic um, that not all countries have, which is that the government, the federal government, and the Congress can pass a law which is absolutely wonderful, motivated perfectly. Actually, there aren't the levers sitting in Washington to get the money to go exactly where you want. Um, it's sort of like, you know, this game you put the ball in and it goes down, it hits, and, you know, you're never really sure where it's going to go. In, in a good way, it's, it basically it's democracy that is sent down to the state and the city and the county level, so to speak. And the problem is, of course, 
that there is a, there is a, that the, the funds are put in, but then the, the, what you really have to do is pull the money into your local community. You have to apply for the money in many instances. And remember when we talk about Justice 40, Justice 40 is a wonderful initiative of the Biden administration. 40% of everything, all these hundreds of billions that will sp be spent on green has to go, have to go to, to communities that are disadvantaged, especially the BIPOC, black, indigenous, and brown uh, communities, so to speak. Uh, so you don't only want the money to go to those places to benefit, you actually want black, brown, and indigenous contractors to win those contracts as well. So in a way, what the role we can play is, is empowering that pull factor, if you like, empowering those on the coal face, <laughs> the bad, bad words, but uh, uh, that th th can actually be build the capacity themselves to do the applications that can support the local contractors, in addition to the point that Nick's making, which is often they need cash up front as well. But, but philanthropy can change the positionality though, right? So, so, you know, like it's not, it's not actually just, it's actually not, it's actually not about the cash, right? Cash changes the positionality to be able to move it, it, the projects forward. Because in the past, I think that what happens to a lot of native communities in, in the green energy industry is the same thing that's happened to the extractive energy, energy industry. Is there's a certain point where there's, when there's an injection of capital, Indian people or indigenous people have no power. Mm, right. And so the, the, it's important for that injection of capital to happen early on so that indigenous communities are not held economic hostage and ha not having to make decisions being held economic hostage. It changes the positionality mm -hmm. and the power structure too. Um, is, as well as the end result. So yeah. we'll take the, the cash too, so. <laughs> <laughs> could I add, could I add one, yeah, one? Yeah. Um, to take a, when you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, there are a lot of brilliant things in there. Heat pumps, a lot of investments for, to get the markets to really change and make renewable energy and efficiency uh, really speed up and ramp up with the markets. What's not in there though is accountability for the polluters. Um, there, it's, it's all carrot and, and no stick, right? Um, because that's what could get through Congress. And that can get through Congress because that's where we are politically. But ultimately, if we are truly to solve this problem, we can't just be building heat pumps and solar panels Why the oil industry continues to expand. They had their biggest quarter ever um, recently. We're still seeing massive expansion. They have a huge proposal in the Arctic and the Willow project they want to do in, in the Arctic, which will have massive implications. So um, this is where philanthropy, why they did an incredible job of, of helping grassroots organizations lobby and advocate for the IRA. We also need philanthropy to support those organizations that are holding industry accountable, that are holding mm -hmm. elected officials <coughs> accountable. So we need a little bit of stick in here as well. We need those, those industries that are driving our, our, our whole globe into a crisis mode to not just be off the hook while we go the long way around it by getting electric cars, we've got to we've got to bring that part into it too, and that's an area where philanthropy sometimes gets a little weary of because it's a lot easier, and, and Democrats as well, right? You know, when when Joe Biden says, "When I think of climate change, I think of jobs," it's that's the easy part, right? It's a very positive pro market part, but we need to think about some of the more parts that are going to hold this these industries that are cause the problem accountable, and that's where I think philanthropy and NGOs have to put equal effort into that side as well. So I'm hearing a very big theme of funding grassroots campaigns um, uh, uh, and, um, uh, and also uh, philanthropy with environmental justice as a, 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 a primary or a, a forefront objective. Um, I'm wondering, maybe Ash, as, as someone who's been researching this um, community, is that move to support environmental justice recent in the last few years? Have we seen it? Have we seen evidence borne out that that's, that that works? Um, is this a recent shift or? Well, I think actually there is a history of uh, philanthropy supporting environmental justice, but um, you know, over the last decades, I think there was a different uh, maybe type of philanthropy happening um, than what we're seeing movements towards now. So uh, a lot of what was happening was what we might call strategic philanthropy. And so a lot of donors were coming at things from, um, you know, 
how can we treat this like a business? You know, where's the bottom line? How are we going to get measurable results and outcomes? Uh, and approaching things from a very, okay, we've got some ideas, this is what we want to see happen, and then approaching it from that strategic or business-like standpoint. Um, and I think, you know, as everyone has mentioned, uh, we are seeing a huge increase in the amount of giving and the amount of attention to this urgently needed uh, issue, uh, but there's also been attention to these donors. So s scrutiny um, calls for more just philanthropy for uh, these donors to work in different ways. And so I do think that uh, donors in general are responding to those calls and are being incredibly reflective. Uh, and I, I think and I hope that they'll continue to be reflective in the way they work in the future. So seeing what works, seeing, uh, listening to what they're hearing from people on the ground and then integrating that and incorporating that into the way, the way that they're working. So I think we are at a moment of change now. Nick and Brian, are you seeing more funding flowing to your organizations? Who was the first? Yeah, I mean, I think we're beginning to see that. I mean, I think, I think we were dealing, indigenous communities are dealing from a place where there was like pretty much almost no investment. I mean, like the, the, the statistic I was talking about before was a half of 1% of philanthropy was going to indigenous people. Um, you know, we might be like barely above a half of 1% right now. <laughs> But like indigenous people in the U.S. are two percent of the population, so let's let's get philanthropy to at least parity in population, and you'll talk about a substantial increase of investment to native communities. So I think you, I think you're you're, see, you're you're beginning to see it. Um, the 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 question is though, you're seeing it across the board, uh, increase increases across the board, and what, what what one of my worries is that. Philanthropy wants to just use their existing old infrastructure, meaning that, okay, instead of funding indigenous communities directly and, and, and believing in the capacity that indigenous communities have, let's, let's, let's fund all of the big green organizations and have them do trickle down philanthropy down to indigenous communities. We're seeing that happening. So all these big green organizations are creating indigenous programs but it's trickle down philanthropy. And that's not working. It's not working for indigenous communities. So there is a increase of investment and we're seeing that, but we're also an organization that's built out infrastructure to do that too. So <laughs> it's a, it's a bad, we're seeing kind of both, both things happening. Yeah, I would say that I think there has been a, a, a huge influx on the, on the nature side of the equation. Uh, a few years ago, Hans Jörg Wies, who's a Swiss American, billionaire um, made a $1 billion pledge for nature, which at the time was the, the largest ever contribution for nature. And then recently uh, joined by, by Jeff Bezos, the Moore Foundation, a few others into a new thing called the Protecting Our Planet Challenge, which, which made a $5 billion um, commitment for nature, which was the largest ever philanthropic gift for nature. And, and that isn't just to one organization, that's going to, um, that's going to community organizations, indigenous groups, some big groups, some small groups, all different parts of the world, but it is, it's fantastic to see this level. It's, the, it's this type of philanthropy we need to see. And what's also great about it is that these philanthropists are not just, you know, a lot of the money that was generated in this country for, for billionaires came from the tech sector. And I think there was a, a feeling from some of those new rich people that technology is going to save us. So if, I, if that's how I made my money in technology, I'm going to save the world by inventing some new thing for that's going to then solve everything. And I think some of these people, Hans Jörg Wies, Jeff Bezos, are saying, you know, I don't, I don't know all the intricacies of climate change or biodiversity conservation. I'm going to go listen to grassroots activists. I'm going to go to Gabon. I'm going to go uh, to Colombia and, and, and meet the people and hear what they say. And invite some of those proposals and, and also an openness to funding, as I've said a few times tonight, to funding that activism and that grassroots engagement that a lot of philanthropists shy away from. I think that's a critical component to the change that we're seeing. And, and to, to one of your earlier points, um, we are, are funding the carrot but, but not the stick. Um, a lot of philanthropy seems to be going towards grassroots at this point and um, environmental justice, uh, but there is this other um, aspect, uh, which is, is how do we really move markets, change the economy, f finance? And Andrew, I know one of the program areas for the Bezos Earth Fund um, is the economy, finance, and markets. So as someone who I'm not particularly familiar with economics, don't really understand it, explain that. How can philanthropy change the economy? 
Well, um, that would be a long conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but, le but let me just say, say this, that um, economic models today still don't really get it yet. For example, if, um, if uh, the United States announced that by 2032, there would be no internal combustion engines sold in the United States for automobiles, all of the economic models, those that are run by the Treasury, those that are run the university, they'd run the model and it would 99% of them would conclude, well, well done, that will have a good effect on climate change, but it will cost your economy. Because they're basically a whole set of simultaneous equations. They fail to understand the new dynamism in, in the economy. So for example, if you actually do that, you drive new technologies, which models actually don't capture. You lower risk, you reduce uncertainty, because at the moment, automobile producers don't know where, where to invest, so to speak. And very importantly, you fundamentally shift expectations. And so, for example, when Prime Minister Modi became Prime Minister, um, he, he, he inherited a, a, a target for solar energy that was 20 gigawatts. And everybody said, well, he's not going to do that because he doesn't really care that much about the environment. He came in and he said, let's not do 20, let's do 100 gigawatts, and we'll do it in the same length of time. He understood disruptive change because what he understood is if you say 100 gigawatts, entrepreneurs will know, my goodness me, something's going on here. There are new industries, there are going to be new technology centers, there's going to be all kinds of opportunities. That's when they invest. You know, and, and it, it, since my boss used to work at Amazon, um, uh, <laughs> he, he, he wrote each year um, a, a letter uh, to his shareholders at the time of the annual. And, and most of them ended with one sentence, which was, it's still day one. What did he mean by that? He meant, even if we are huge, let's not lose that day one feeling that we're here to change things. What's that got to do with it? What can philanthropy do? Philanthropy can help reform economics, which is what we're trying to do. Um, and there's a whole new school of economics that understands this. But much more than that, philanthropy can help us do what economics has known they ought to be doing since 1925 when Professor Pigou wrote his Economics of Welfare, which basically said, when you have pollution, you should tax it. And you should not tax good things like work and profits, although I, I'm in favor of taxing both of those, but you should certainly tax bad things like pollution and congestion. So what we can do, we can both do analytical work, but then we can do what's called the C4 work, which is the political advocacy work we're working at the moment, for example, on um, uh, what's called CBAN, which is um, uh, border adjustment measures so that if you want to import into this country highly carbon intensive, you ought to pay a tax on it. We should be doing a deal with Europe on that. That's an example of the kinds of things that we can be doing. We need to shift the way our economy prices things. And um, my last question before we move on to some Q&A here is we've been talking this whole time really about big philanthropy, but I think um, a, lo a lot of us are wondering, for, for those of us who um, maybe have a little bit of disposable income, but um, not nearly the amount that we're talking about, how can we make our dollars or efforts most impactful? And I'm, I'm interested in hearing from, from each of you on this. How, c how can, the, we'll say, the ordinary citizen make the biggest impact with their contributions? Who wants to go first? I'll, I'll let Peter go. Sure. I think that's a very tough question. I, I struggle with this myself as somebody with two young children who, you know, uh, as someone who's very conscious about the environment, um, you know, every decision I make feels like it's weighted, you know, the purchases I make. And so, you know, I think that it goes down to, um, you know, for me, Am I making choices that I can sleep well at night um, knowing that I put my money in places that 
are going to support the things that are important to me. Um, and am I voting? And am I engaged in local politics? Am I making a change where I can do so, you know, in addition to the research I do and the teaching I do, which I think are very important. So um, I think it's a really tough question. And I sometimes get frustrated when we put the onus on individuals, especially when we see so much systemic and structural uh, stuff going on, you know, has been mentioned here, th this isn't just a matter of, of one, one person who's very wealthy making a difference or one organization or one issue. There are systemic issues here that need to change. So um, I think it's very complicated. Well, actually, actually the, the much better answer than I was going to say. So <laughs> um, I, I tend to, when I think of, and I don't, I don't have a lot of money for it, but what I, I do give to organizations, and I guess what I try to do is Rather than I used to try to spread around and you know send a hundred dollars here and forty dollars here and and um, and now I've tried to say let's let me see if I can get the majority of what I give to like one organization or my wife and I each decide like one each and we we try to make a really meaningful gift to those organizations and it's usually very small organizations local organizations that we know we know the people and the reason we do that is having worked in a nonprofit. There's a lot of care and feeding that goes into donors, even a, even a $25 donor just sending out the newsletter. You start to you, some, you sometimes lose money on on some small dollar donors, and I, I thought let's let's try to consolidate that and not dabble and recognize that uh, my small gifts aren't going to save the world, but they may make a real difference to that one organization on one particular program that I'm comfortable with. So that's that's what I tend to do and encourage on the smaller level donors to do. Yeah, and I, I would say you know investing in a structural change. It, it prioritize investing in structural change. It doesn't matter if it's ten dollars a month or five dollars a month or you know whatever your ability is, because a lot of times there's, there's like a difference between charity and change. A lot of times it ch charity has to do with the person giving and how it makes them feel, mm -hmm. and change has to do with like addressing root causes. And so I think that we have to recognize that like giving at this moment in history. Like, given what is before humanity, it needs to be less about how, what, how we individually feel about how we're giving, and it needs to be addressing societal structural problems and recognizing that's one of the ways that we can actually do it. And, and, and then I, I think giving consistently, too. I think that, like, uh, being, you know, being somebody oh, who's run grassroots organizations, $25 a month, for a year, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. You start collecting those, all of a sudden, you know, and, and you start to stabilize uh, grassroots community efforts where you can actually see the, and, and feel the impact of that too, so. Mm. So um, you said it doesn't matter how we feel. I was actually gonna say, follow your heart, which I guess sounds <laughs> like it's the opposite. But, but I, I think, especially if you've got kids, um, it's very important to pick something that really warms your heart and will help them to understand. If you're, I mean, a small example, we were privileged to take our kids to Africa, you know, and we did what you can do. You spend a day on a farm and, and you talk about actually how it, wonderful it is to bring these molecules of carbon dioxide up there down to earth in the form of trees and bushes and crops and soils where they bring life and vitality. And now financing restoration in Africa is a very exciting thing for us. Um, why? Because it not only solves climate change, that's actually not why you do it, even though it's a fantastic, it only costs like $3 a ton uh, of carbon, so it's a fantastic deal for climate. You actually do it because it makes local communities more resilient, it gives them better food security, it increases the income of the farmers and so on. So, so if you can bring it to life like that, and I agree with what you're all saying, I mean, be consistent, don't spread it all over. I would personally say don't be so, we, we tend to be so analytical, don't we? Um, and I shouldn't be saying this in my current job, but, but, <laughs> but actually, you know, go, go where your heart is here and, and go and look at it. And, you know, and maybe you, you'll invite us out to the Dakotas where we can come and see what you, the fantastic what you're doing, but, but go and, and, and see what's happening. <clears throat> Thank you all. Um, I'm, I'm gonna take some questions from the audience now. Um, and um, Andrew, this, this actually is a good question following on what you said. Um, that seems like fantastic advice for individuals giving small donations, but how do philanthropic organizations shield themselves 
from the broader priorities and whims of individual wealthy donors. Well, I mean, you, you build a world-class team that has a lot of experience and you, um, you have really great conversations. And, you know, quite honestly, if somebody very wealthy chooses to put their money apart, they, their heart's probably in the right place. Um, and um, generally, they, they are very up for the right conversations. And I mean, I can speak, uh, you know, truthfully about just the fantastic um, uh, conversations that, that we're having with the Bezos Earth Fund. So, uh, you know, I, I haven't had a problem in that regard whatsoever. <clears throat> I, got, I got something just to piggyback on that a little bit too. Some, something, you know, with institutional, I mean, I think institutional philanthropy can take some notes, to be honest, from some of the bigger funders who've decided we're not starting an endowment. The problems are now. Mm -hmm. The things that need to be solved are now. So we're not going to start some endowment to hoard wealth and create perpetual philanthropy. And so, like, I mean, I, I, think that, I think that institutional philanthropy should push themselves in thinking about, like, do, what are we investing into? And if it's not good, and it historically hasn't been good, should there be conversations about institutional philanthropy sunsetting their foundations and thinking about not just getting out that money out onto the street in the, t in the short term, but radically you know, investing into change right here and right now, instead of investing into the institution of philanthropy to perpetuate its oneself. Um, and so, you know, and, and, and so I, I think that's, I think that's a, there's an opportunity to engage in those conversations. And I know some people are like, what the hell, that's crazy. But I mean, we have big problems really, really big problems. And so I think there's some, some notes that institutional philanthropy can take from, you know, can take from this moment in history. Nick, this question is sp specifically for you, but then I, I do wanna hear from any of others if you have thoughts on this. How do you actually measure the success of philanthropic dollars? I think for, um, how, how does philanthropy do that? Or how do, how do we? How do you, well, how do you, we'll start with you, how do you do it? Um, so we, like, we have a pretty, ex uh, I was, we were actually talking about this before this panel, um, Indian Collective has a, like a, a pretty extensive um, 141 metric system that we created that actually supersedes most foundations that are trying to invest into us because we're interested in <coughs> investing into the changing of the landscape, right? So if you can change the conditions in which indigenous people are organizing and building power, then you can th then it can be sustained over time, mm -hmm. and so um, creating these metrics that are based on real life things, and, and and I think that because we're you know we're 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 talking about the most underinvested, poorest communities in the western in the western hemisphere that we're investing into, there's all these indicators that have the ability to change, but make sure those indicators are coming from the community, coming uh, they're not coming from Government, they're not coming from philanthropy saying, well, this is what we think your indicators of change and impact should be. And if you meet these indicators, we'll invest into you. Um, we've sort of taken the charge on that, we've grabbed the bull by the horns and saying, you know, we wanna, we wanna, see, we wanna see biodiversity you know, increased, we wanna see jobs increased, we wanna see, you know, we wanna see the life expectancy of indigenous people, you know, go from the lowest in the Western Hemisphere to, you know, on the upward ends. Like we want to create these things that di have direct impacts on lives. So I think that, I think that's one of the most important things is that like those impacted being a part of creating what those actual metrics are. Um, because the, I mean, those are our families, you know, those are our people, those are the people in our communities. And then translating that to, uh, to philanthropy to get them to understand why we chose those metrics. Um, and, and have some healthy dialogue about that. Other thoughts on that? How we measure success of the philanthropic dollars? Yeah, I think that um, a, a couple things. I think it's really important, and I, what Nick said about the number of metrics, I think is critical, that organizations need to be accountable to their missions and to really have those metrics. I think there's a, we, we're forgiving a lot in the environmental community because people care passionately about forests or animals or other things, and so we forgive people who are really passionate, who maybe aren't always effective at their at their efforts, and, and in a way in a business where people would just say, you're not meeting your quarterly quota, you're out. Um, 
Um, and so we, we tolerate sometimes perpetual just, you know, passion without, without results. And so given the scale of the climate crisis, we need to, um, we need to have some results. We just don't have a, a time to just kind of care without moving the needle on policy. So we try to have very specific, tangible metrics on are we going to achieve this policy in the Convention on Biological Diversity? How many hectares of indigenous land has been tenured and secured? How many, um, how many dollars are, are we getting the German government to put into climate change that they didn't put in last year? So we have, we have metrics in each, in each of those areas. But having said that and needing these metrics, there also needs to be some patience with philanthropy that it takes a little time to build up grassroots capacity. So you need to have those metrics, but you need to give a little bit of time to do that. So for instance, if I wanted to create a million acre marine protected area, um, it may take 10 years to work with the community to get that, to get that organized. It doesn't mean I get 100,000 acres in year one, and some philanthropists want to have 100, where's my 100,000 acres? You said you get a million acres in, in, in 10 years, so shouldn't I have 100,000 acres by now? And it could be zero acres for nine years and, and, a, and a million in year 10. So uh, that kind of, yes, accountability, but also recognize what the organizations need to meet that, um, to meet that goal. Uh, I just want to add to both uh, what Nick and Brian just said, and I think it's really important to balance that uh, interest in accountability with, all, with not placing too much administrative burden mm -hmm. on organizations that are doing the really hard work on the ground. Um, I know from my research that uh, long-term post-project evaluation independently done by foundations is very rare. Um, so it's something mm -hmm. that I sort of wonder if maybe foundations or large donors could take on themselves um, and finding a way to do that so that there's not a huge burden placed on the organizations themselves because we have to find uh, a tension between that kind of accountability that you're talking about uh, with also making sure that people are able to focus on the work that really needs to be done. This, and, is, a, and this is a really good point is that t too many philanthropists are, are, are very demanding in terms of not only annual reports, quarterly reports and all kinds of uh, you know results frameworks and so on, and we're really trying very very hard to have the best of both worlds, whereby you do want to be precise, but maybe we could help do some of the accountability. So, for example, some of the things you could be quite precise. So we we put fifty million dollars into a system which, using satellites and then ground truth with drones and so on, we'll be able to see land use change everywhere on the Earth's surface every week. Um, and increasingly now we're able to see what, if on our restoration projects, what kinds of trees, you can see that from space. You can actually now very soon be able to know how much carbon is embedded in that. So that actually in our new project that we just launched in uh, Sharm El Sheikh, we'll have a, a thousand different shape files which we put into this system. The farmer or whoever's doing it doesn't need to do a thing. We can actually measure like that. Um, so that's, that's, that's one way, but um, what you do not want to do is just burden the, um, burden the grantee excessively. <laughs> um, here's an interesting question. In October, in October, the Chronicle of Philanthropy published an op-ed entitled, Conservatives Care About Climate Too, Philanthropy Should Stop Ignoring Them. Given what's required for decarbonization, it seems bipartisan, bipartisan commitment will be required. So do you work on climate action with people coming at it from right of center? How can philanthropy build the eco-right field? And what questions would you need to answer to support right of center work? So, so the answer is uh, absolutely uh, yes, we must do that. And maybe it's not something that the environmental movement has traditionally understood, um, although some have. Um, Important to remember, I'm sure you've seen surveys of the most environmental presidents in US history. I mean, actually, um, number one, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, number two, although he didn't deserve it, Richard Nixon. Um, Richard Nixon, you know, uh, oversaw the creation of, uh, you know, of the EPA and so on. Um, but it's really the Teddy Roosevelt school that is the, the school that now is very, very interested in nature. Last week, we spent the day on Capitol Hill with, um, with Republican senators and Congress people and some Democrats as well, talking about the possibility of a, 
of a new uh, US um, uh, uh, program for international conservation. So uh, absolutely we need to do it. Um, and, and indeed, um, we need to be just a lot more thoughtful. So for example, um, you, know, you think about rural areas generally have been, the, the view is they're less, involved, less interested in climate change. Um, but actually, it's the farmers that are the managers of carbon. Um, we need more car. People say we need to decarbonize. We don't. We need to recarbonize rural areas. And we need to have a narrative that is just much more attractive for those in different contexts. I think one, I think one thing about it is it's also like we, we, we do need to define what we're fighting for, though. Because, like, if we stay on this whole, you know, left and right, you know, conservative, you know, liberal thing, like, it's not going to work. Like, we, we need to participate in a just transition, in a just transition, you know, away from a fossil fuel-based economy. But there's things that we can be changing in that. And so there's, there's a little bit of, like, honestly, responsibility that, like, like the conservative folks that are fighting for these things, they, they're still thinking about the environment as a siloed thing. They're still thinking about climate as a siloed thing, as opposed it's th that it's not integrated into a just society. It's not, in, it's not integrated into uh, economics. And I think that, like, you know, in the climate justice movement, what we're often talking about is a, ju a, a just transition away from fossil fuels, but into a, uh, a regenerative economy that has regenerative, and, and that means regenerative politics, too. That means regenerative, that means approaches that ho are helping to achieve a justice and equity. Not just, not just fighting climate, but improve, improving quality of life, tearing down some of these systems. So there's, uh, there's some, you know, I, I, I would push back and say that there's some political education uh, that needs to happen in order for this to be done effectively. And, you know, in my observation, I think most of the on the right, the, the money that goes into the space is, is in opposition to action on, on climate change. We see it funding kind of phony grassroots groups. We see it funding business associations that will say something positive and then lobby to kill progressive bills in, in Congress. And so, um, you know, the Koch brothers are an example of funding these kind of pop-up groups that had, that had blocked, uh, I've gone against them in oil and gas proposals and other progressive conservation efforts around the around the Western United States. So yeah, I'm sure that there are some outliers on the right that, that, that will fund climate philanthropy, but I have to say currently it's the, it's the exception. The, the vast majority of money from the right is going to fund a continuation of the status quo, um, more advocacy for keeping oil and gas industry going and fighting progress on climate and nature in my view. So we're almost out of time. I wanna have ask one last final question and this will kind of bring us full circle back to where we started. So if it's gonna cost four to nine trillion dollars, where is the rest of the money gonna come from? How much, how much is realistic to think will come from philanthropy and what is the thinking behind how we could potentially get to where we need to be? No. <laughs> I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll take a crack at this. I mean, I think that that money is going to have to come largely from governments, and the way governments are going to get it are from, from businesses. I mean, the oil and gas companies had a massive windfall just in the last quarter. They should be paying for, the, for a lot of the damage that they've caused on climate. We, we, don't, we don't tax oil and gas companies for the, for the damage they've done, for the massive windfall profits that they're making. So governments say we don't have money for climate change. Well, if you had some political will to hold those responsible for causing climate change, you would have a whole lot of money, and then you could start to fund this. You could also fund innovations and incentives for businesses that are doing positive things. Solar manufacturers, electric vehicle manufacturers, efficiency, heat pumps, um, this sort of thing. Nature conservation itself isn't a money-making scheme. You know, that, it costs money. It's just like paying for roads or others. We need natural infrastructure, and so governments are gonna have to pay that. So in my mind, it has to be a big role of government. What can philanthropy do? Philanthropy can, ad, can fund advocacy organizations that are holding government people accountable to, to put more money into this. They can partner with governments. The 
Bezos Earth Fund and the Weiss Foundation partnered with the German government to do a big thing called the Legacy Landscapes Fund where they're endowing national parks throughout the world. Um, and, and the private philanthropy is putting up some of that upfront money and the public donors, the government donors are putting in the endowment money for these places so they can be managed in perpetuity. So I don't, philanthropy can't close that gap for its individual dollars, but it can close the gap through its funding of advocacy in my mind is the best way to close it. Go ahead. At the risk of everyone disagreeing with me, um, there's plenty of money. Um, the money Easy is out there. Easy for you to say. The money, <laughs> the money <laughs> is out there. The, the, the economy is a hundred trillion dollar economy. We're investing, what, 20 trillion dollars a year. We shouldn't think of this when we say, oh, we need six trillion. We shouldn't think of it as a cost. It is an investment in the future. So the issue is not, where's the money? The issue, well, the, the, the issue is, we need to move the money from what it's doing now. It's now investing in bad things, and it needs to invest in good things. And we need to demonstrate that actually investing in good things will lead to a more sustainable economy, as well as a more sustainable society, as well as a more just society. So in a way, we have to, comes back to sort of where do you intervene to get these tipping points crossed? Um, it's, 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 it's all about leverage. You know, I mean, it, you know, Archimedes said, you know, you give me a lever long enough and a, a yes. fulcrum that is, that is firm and I'll move, move the world. We, we all need to know where our fulcrum is <laughs> and where our lever is. And that's how we should be looking at it. So there's plenty of money, but we are gonna have to do all kinds of tweaks. But the most important thing is to shift the way that decisions are made. And that includes the financial system where, as you know, a year ago, $130 trillion were committed to net zero. And, and over the last year, it's been unraveling a little bit. We need to hold that accountable so that that entire portfolio gradually sort of shifts towards the right direction. In, in climate science, we talk a lot about feedback loops. Usually they're negative feedback yes. loops we'll leading to them. further warming. But it sounds like what we're talking about here is that philanthropy can catalyze a positive feedback loop to absolutely help right. move us, cool. move that money to where it you know, needs to be to solve the problem. That's absolutely right. And we, we, one tiny example, we were just talking about it yesterday. We are working on steel and cement, which is really, really polluting, very hard to abate. The trick is actually to, to know that 50% of all the cement in this country is purchased by the government and 20% of all the steel is purchased by the government. So we have a program to work with different states to have procurement rules changed. That's a way that you gradually get the steel companies to start thinking, actually, it makes more sense to do it differently, and you gradually move it around. That's just one of a 1,000 examples. <coughs> Thank you. I think we are out of time. I think we could continue to talking for another four trillion hours, um, but we should take it out to um, uh, the reception outside. So thank you all again so much for joining us. Thank you all for joining us um, today. Thank you.